Hello, Sinners, Saints, and Sisters. Sinner Saint Sister is a podcast that values curiosity over certainty. We tell the truth about how we feel around here, and we do our best to love our neighbor and serve our God, and we readily admit that some days are harder than others. Thank you so much for the community that we have created here. I hope you enjoy these two bonus episodes, and I hope that you're having a happy Advent, and have a Merry Christmas. I love LA. The mountains, the ocean, the desert, the breeze, the bearded palm trees, fake healers, vapid shop owners, the whimsical waiters, restless spirits, the curious old days and sun-kissed style, stucco, glitter, criminals, dreams. I'm an LA girl. My son and I were blessed to be invited to the LA premiere of The Shift. Out in theaters now, everybody go see The Shift. I am convinced there is a section of heaven that looks like a cast and crew coming together to celebrate good, creative work, celebrating each other. We had the very best time. Brock Heasley, writer and director of The Shift, has become a friend over the years. This is his third time on the show. And there's probably a good bit of magic involved in why we love the people the way that we do, but I am a forever fan of Brock Heasley. You're going to love this conversation about the double meanings of his movie, the thing that he has so bravely released into the world. I celebrate creative Christian work, and it is all my pleasure to introduce to you again, author, writer, director, Brock Heasley. Hello, Brock Heasley, writer and director of The Shift. I am so excited to have you on today to talk about all of the celebrating that there is to do. And I have something to tell you. Guess what? What's that? What? You are the very first guest to be on Center Saint Sister three times. No kidding. Am I really? <laughs> That's yes. cool. Isn't that great? That's really I love cool. it so that much. That is an honor. That really is. That's awesome. <laughs> and I've been doing this since 2017, I think. So um, welcome back. We were just together in LA. There was this yes. ver um, very red carpet, very nearby, and it was all very exciting. Um, red carpet's totally normal. Um, however, <laughs> I think they are going to be becoming very normal for you, Brock. Um I actually wanted to start by talking a little bit about that night. I'm so thrilled for you. Um, how yeah. how was that for you? Oh, that was that was a that was a great night. That was one of the more memorable and and greatest nights of my life. 100. percent um, You know, I've been fighting this fight to get um, this movie made called The Shift for eight years, and to walk that red carpet and to to walk it with you uh, was just was just extraordinary, as you can imagine. It was really the the moment in which I mean, there's been several moments, but I think that was the moment in which I I sat there and, and I thought to myself, "Well, I actually did it. Like we actually this did it. it. We, we got we yeah. got the thing done." So um, <laughs> yeah, it's really weird now waking up every day and realizing, "Oh yeah, we already did the red card. Like it's done. Yeah, it's done. that oh, happened. I, I can't work on this movie anymore." <laughs> it's, <laughs> Very odd. Uh, I had such a good time um, meeting your beautiful wife. She was just ravishing that night. I just, it was the whole I thing. And, and I don't know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and so did you. You looked fantastic. Thank you. I did try very hard. Um, <laughs> but the whole thing was just so, I hope that you felt this too, but there was something electric about it. Yeah. I think that we were all born um, to work and to earn and to use our gifts. And there, there's, there's a lot of nobility in that. We're, we're born to do it. But there was something about knowing that you've done your work well, which is no small thing, you know, to use your talents mm -hmm. well. But when you've used them for some greater purpose, I feel like everyone was just walking around with this really beautiful sense of accomplishment that they hadn't just done their job, but they had right. done it for this greater purpose. There was this, there was a, a beautiful camaraderie among mm -hmm. all of us there. I, I hope that you felt that too. Did you? No, I, I definitely felt that. And I'm glad that that you felt that because that means that was yeah. a very real feeling, you know, that it wasn't yeah. just me. That that was the energy in the room. And um and ultimately, you know, look, anytime you put art out into the world, 
everybody's got opinions and and that's one of the sure. one of the really difficult things is that we've put this out into the world and now i really can't say much about it like now everybody else is, <laughs> is talking about it and and some yeah. people most people it seems very very much love it but then other people don't so i have to look within myself don't i and i have to say okay sure. well what have i done what do i think of what i've done and more importantly what does he think of what i've done and absolutely on that note, you know, in that respect, it's exactly as you say, where I feel like, you know what, I did the thing that I was supposed to do. And, That's right. and it's turned out the way it was supposed to turn out. So there's a great deal of satisfaction that comes from that. Yeah. Yeah. We got to celebrate together. It was a party. Yes. But it was a purposeful party. And I did want to ask right. you about that because I would imagine that the question of of how do you feel is probably becoming um, a little old. And so just to get more specific, I'm glad that you brought this up. But I don't know about you, but I sometimes have what can feel like a complicated relationship with the things that I that I create. Sometimes I don't even really know how I feel about them until mm -hmm. I show them to someone else that's trusted. And then when they either like it or don't, I, oh, okay, well, maybe I do like it if they like it. And you can imagine how that all becomes a little booby trapped with um, becoming dependent on how other people feel about the things that you make. And it can get sidetracked from, like you said, the audience of one. I really only care what God thinks or um, just doing it for the process because you enjoy the process, not necessarily yeah. the outcome, but I just enjoy making. And so, which I think also really, really delights the Lord. So my, my question to you, I guess, is twofold. Um, how are people's responses, you know, making you feel? Are you attached to people's responses? Are you more attached to your own response now that you've given your art away? That's a really, really good question. I think I'm still more attached to my own response, which I think is yeah. probably healthier. Yeah. Um, yes, because much. Yeah. because if if I was just thrown about by the winds of somebody's opinion. Um, and, and I, and I bought into that and said, oh, they didn't like it. I didn't like it for this reason. Oh, well then I guess, I guess it's not, I guess I don't, I guess I don't feel good about it after all. I guess it's not good. And on the same token, if somebody's like, oh my gosh, you're a genius. This is a masterpiece. I don't want to buy into that either. You know, like that's right. Unhealthy. Um, uh, so, good. so, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta play it somewhere in the middle. And I think, I think I have a pretty healthy relationship with the art I've created. Like I, I know it's not perfect, but I think it's pretty great. Yeah. And I think it's what <laughs> I set out to do. And I think it's what he wanted me to make. And uh, and I think I'm excited to make something else and make it even better than this one. Oh. Um, so I think that's a pretty healthy place. I don't know. I guess I'll find out over time, but it feels good to me. <laughs> yes and amen. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, so I can't imagine making something and then having to turn it over because it's not complete with just you. So you have mm -hmm. to turn what you've made, what you've been thinking about, you have to turn it over to other artists to complete something that's been in only your head for years. Right. Um, how do you feel about this final version? I, I feel like um, all of these artists came together to kind of, to do their own thing, you know, like, do you have a favorite part? Was there something that came together that was maybe even better than you imagined? Well, it's look, film is a hugely collaborative experience. And so you're right. Yeah. At some point, you know, I have to, and this, this point usually comes about the time when you start pre-production where you have to take it out of your head and you've got to hand it over to other people and let them do it because do, do their thing, do their part, because I can't do everything. I, I have no musical right. ability, for example. Right. You know? So the, so the music in the film, um, I didn't generate any of that. Um, mm -hmm. now that's not to say that I wasn't involved. I was heavily involved, you know, as the director, my job really is to keep the vision intact, to understand right. tonally, um, what is going on in the film and what it needs to look and feel and sound like, and to also keep track of the different layers and the nuance and the purpose of the story to make sure that, you know, we're not getting off the rails. And so even with something like, like the music, um, you know, that was a constant back and forth where I yeah. was, you know, and, and it, it was difficult because I was working with Grammy winning musicians, Dan Hasseltine and, and, and Matt Nelson are incredibly accomplished musicians. And here I am telling them, no guys, that, like, that doesn't work. You got to go back. You got to make yeah. that sound, you know, you yeah. got to make that sound deeper. You got to make that sound, 
you know, a happier, whatever, whatever the, that was, yeah. that was a terrible direction I just gave, but I gave better direction to these guys <laughs> in the moment. But it was literally hundreds, if not thousands of notes passed between us, you know, as we, as we sure. did this, this, the, the composition and the whole time I'm like, I'm not a musician, <laughs> but right. But you don't they, have the language. It's not your craft. I yeah. I often did not have the language. And so sometimes they would have to interpret what I was trying to say, but they're such great collaborators, collaborators. It went great. So cool. And I mentioned the music because I think the, the question you asked me, is did something turn out better than I expected? And I think mm -hmm. when I think about all of the elements of the film, I mean, I could go to the performances and I could go to all of that, but I think because it was the most recent thing we completed, which was the music, it was very, like it was completed just about two and a half weeks ago. Um, oh. And the film only just barely came out. <laughs> Um, it's, it's one amazing. of those, it's one of those elements I can point to and say, wow, did that ever turn out better than I even hoped for? Um, yeah. this, the music in this film is, is just gorgeous. It, it, it really yeah. is. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Brock, I loved the movie so much. And I feel like saying that is, um, a little unexpected for me. Not only can I be critical about how I like our our Christian story told, because I can be, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. also like sci-fi isn't necessarily my genre of choice, but I think that this was a little genre bending, don't you? So like, if yeah. you are like me, friends, if you are like me and like sci-fi might not necessarily be, just don't let that don't let that keep you away from theaters. Although if you're not used to sci-fi, you might need to see it twice. I picked up so much the second time. Um, so I just want to put that out there. Like first and foremost, I loved it so much. This is not your stereotypical sci-fi. Um, can we get into what I love the most? Let's do it. Yeah. What is it? I'm, I'm so curious. <laughs> okay. I, first of all, uh, okay. The benefactor. The benefactor, mm -hmm. the benefactor, the benefactor. Brock, listen. So first of all, Neil was 100% incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, nuanced and 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 cold and steely and incredible and yet enticing and incredible. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take anything away from his performance, but you, Brock, you wrote a couple of things in there. You, there is the the way that you created him and the things that you had him say, they made me just hold my breath a second. You know how there's that that hesitation of of truth that when someone says something and you kind of go, ooh, that's true. Yeah. And there's just that moment, there's that moment of pause that you kind of hold on to. I had several moments like that. And dear God, I love you for it being just a moment that we didn't have to go in with um, laborious dialogue that we didn't have that, that instead I could just sit with it and I could turn it over at home a little bit, you know, and, and kind of figure right. some things out. So that was my favorite. That was my, I, I feel like Christian spaces can, can do that. You know, we can become a little too explicit. You know, I feel right. like there's a lot of bravery on your part in leaving something out there for people to wrestle with. And so there's a lot of trust. There's a lot of courage. Um, maybe, maybe bravery isn't the right word. Instead, it's confidence. There's a lot of confidence in that. So I want to thank you for that, number one. But um, to get into the specifics of the benefactor, if I, if I may, um, yes. there were some quotes that I would love for you to expound on here. Because we, you didn't, and again, thank you, necessarily do that in the movie. But what if we could do it right. here? Right. Yeah, okay. sure. Let's, so, let's talk about it. I, I'm just, oh, I'm so excited. I love it so much. Okay. So the benefactor says at one point, he says, small deviations work the best. And so, I, oh, by the way, friends, I'm going to try to stay away from potential spoilers. I am going to try to stay away, but I am warning you that I might get excited and quit thinking that way and do it on accident. So I'm just, so what you need to do is you need to go see the movie. Okay. Hit pause, go see the movie and then come back. Okay, so um, small deviations work the best. Can you can you tell me about that? Yeah. So that is in the in the context of the film, it's a sci fi line, obviously, um, because in the film there is this concept of people being shifted away from the reality in which they they occupy, and um, what the benefactor is referring to is he's saying small deviations work best. It's best when people move 
into a reality which is only a little bit different from from where they are and if you if you move into a reality that's too far away from what you're used to it can kind of mess with your head and it, mm-hmm. and it, it can it can make you unstable and we see that happen mm-hmm. to a character mm-hmm. in the film where they sit, they go into reality yeah. that's just too far apart and and you just see how they're affected by that but 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 when it's doing small deviations work best when it when it is these small deviations which the benefactor says this is this is what's happening to everybody all the time is they're constantly being moved into realities they're just a little bit different and what he means by that is is that it's really the little things that trip us up it's these yeah. it's these little disagreements and these little mm. you know differences of opinion that we have with people that we as human beings instead of seeing them as small things and small differences for example, my wife and I, we've had definitely had some big fights about who's supposed to pay the bills. That is not an important <laughs> thing to fight about. Um, and, but we've made it much bigger than it than it should be. And so from the benefactor's perspective, he doesn't really have to do th- things that are that dramatic to us in order to tip us over into a place where we are doing something wrong or we're causing, we're having contention with those around us. Yeah, A small deviation will work just fine. And in fact, it actually works best. It works best. Gosh, I know it. I I really feel the um, you know, we all know that if if the an enemy were to come with with red horns and a tail and a pitchfork, of course, with like neon signs saying this sure. way, this way, this way, we would, we would, would never know well easier, in- wouldn't it? <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> no well intentioned person of goodwill would, you know, would go happily along. But instead, mm-hmm. there, there's trickery. There's trickery there. So speaking of trickery, um, I feel like um Christians, because Christians, we believe in heaven, and we we use this promise of eternity. We use heaven as an explanation um, for the pain in this world, mm-hmm. and it helps us to make sense of that pain. I believe in a good God, and I, I look around, and I see that good things are happening to bad people, and I see that bad things are happening to, to good people, but I know that this life isn't all there is. To this world, and right. so we can we can make sense of that, um, and so God can continue to work out His goodness in, in an afterlife. And as a Christian that is making sense of suffering, that it is peaceful, and um, we can dodge pain on earth with that. But this line got me in the movie, also from the benefactor, and he says he quickly moves on, but he says very briefly, he says, "I don't judge you, I don't judge you." Right. I don't judge you. And I thought about that. And I went home with that. And I thought about that. And I thought about the power of that. Because if it's heaven that makes suffering make sense for me, mm-hmm. I think that for someone who does not believe, I don't judge you. That is something that makes suffering make sense here. So all of these things are going wrong in your life. All of these things are going wrong in the world and we're all doing the best that we can. I don't judge you. I don't hold you to anything. And I thought about the freedom of that. So if I feel freedom because of an eternity, because of a heaven, I think about the freedom of not being judged for here and now. Right. Wow. You know, and so how that it now we know that what an enemy gives us is half truths, right? Right. So right. can we talk about that line when you wrote it? It's funny you should even highlight that line because it's almost a joke line in the film, you know? He's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah. He, he, he sounds like a toddler, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and he's, he's talking to Kevin about, hey, I can give you anything you want. And at this point in the movie, Kevin's been subsisting on a diet of baked beans, and he's like, hey, you like mm-hmm. baked beans so much, I'll get you a truck full. Like, eh, yeah. I don't judge, yeah. you know, like, that's fine. Yeah. Like, whatever oh. you want, <laughs> you know. Um, oh, that's funny. And, that's funny. But but it is but it is a line that also has meaning. Um, the benefactor is one of those characters that if you want to dig in, there's definitely two or three layers of meaning to pretty much everything he's saying. And that was mm. that was by design. You know, I was trying to this is the way I thought of it and this is difficult for some people to understand but I think it makes sense if you've seen the movie I was trying to tell the truth with lies that's what I was trying to do that's what the benefactor's yeah. doing he's he's lying yeah. constantly but he's but we're figuring out the truth through it 
Yeah. And yeah. so one of these ideas that he doesn't judge, you know, for some people, that's a very comforting thought. Some people, they look at God and they think, that's just a guy that's just judging me on all day, every day. Like, it's just, I can't, I'm constantly having to live up to his expectations. And that's a judgment that I feel. And some people feel that as, you know, as a negative force in their lives, either through their yeah. own misunderstanding or, or, or through, yes. you know, sins that they've committed, which, you know, you're, you're going to feel that. Um, and, and it's a very popular worldly idea that, Hey, we should, you know, we shouldn't pass judgment on anything or, or anybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this gets conflated with the Christian idea of, no, actually it's true. We're not supposed to judge people. We're really not. It's, you know, we're not supposed to judge unrighteously. Um, I think righteous judgment is judging actions is, but not judging people. That's kind of how I think of righteous judgment. Um, but there is this idea that, that that's for us as people, but I there like is that. certainly this idea with God that yes, there is a judgment. There is a judgment that we are all headed for. Um, and, and there is, I, and I think judgment really is just the idea of accountability. Um, it's, it's that we will be accountable for the things, um, that, that we have done. Um, and the devil tries to say, no, there's no accountability. There's no accountability yeah. at all. There's no judgment. You know, you can do mm -hmm. whatever you want and it's going to be fine. That's mm -hmm. what he says. And so that's kind of what he's telling Kevin here. It's like, hey, man, like I accept you, you know, like he's yeah, going to judge you. Right. I accept you. Right. But right. the but the thing that he's not telling Kevin is, is that happiness actually comes through judgment and accountability. Yeah. Because if we just do what we want to do, if we just eat baked beans all day, every day, that will make us miserable. It, it really will. I, I no one wants that much, that many baked beans, um, <laughs> you know. And so we need we need the judgment of God. We need His accountability. We need some understanding of a higher purpose to our actions in order to craft them in the direction that leads to our happiness. Happiness mm -hmm. is not indulgence. Happiness is not I get to do whatever I want. Happiness is not selfishness. Um, yeah. And so so judgment and accountability. These are very important things in our lives that we have to wrestle with, but we have to wrestle with them appropriately because they can, yeah. they can be something. I mean, the, the lesson of Job is that not everything that is bad that happens to you is judgment. Some, some things are just right. things that happen. And that's really what the right. shift is about. It's a tricky subject. It really is. It's a nuanced thing. And the benefactor in that moment, he's trying to remove the nuance and he's trying to say, no, this is, this is pretty simple. You don't need to be judged. Don't worry about it. Gosh. And that's just not true. Just a simple dialogue about a can of baked beans went to all those right. places. And I love it so much. <laughs> I love it so much. Thank you. Thank you for not connecting those dots any closer in the movie, but for doing it here. It's a real gift. I was thinking, you said a couple of things um, that made me think that acceptance, acceptance is something that we all want. Um, right. And so it's something that he's offering but he's offering it falsely and and then pointing, saying and insinuating or implying that acceptance could never really happen there, except right. we hear in the movie that we are never just a sum of all the bad things that we've done. And so right. what God is offering us is acceptance with our imperfection acceptance. there's there's this calm acceptance that happens when we're not, you know, you mentioned, um, the stress or the pressure of, of feeling like you need to live under God and his expectations. And so, you know, living under God, it can be a, that can be a scary place to be. Um, I've certainly been there or living above God. That can be a really frustrating place to be when you won't do what you ask, you know, right. um, even, even living for God, that can be an exhausting place to be. And I Absolutely. feel like what God is inviting us to that, that the benefactor would love for us to not know would love to cut this part out is that really what God is asking of us is for, is for a withness of God. So I know that you're imperfect. That's not a surprise to me. I'm merciful towards your tendencies. I'm just asking that you take me with you in all of these places. And mm -hmm. the benefactor is trying to imply that you'll never be welcome there with the things right. that you've done. And it's just right. simply not the full truth. Oh, what a gift. Um, okay, so you mentioned the the book of Job. Um, the The other thing that a benefactor asserts is that our protagonist here, um, he isn't up against evil 
as much as he is up against himself. Mm-hmm. And so that there's really a, a selfishness um, to like, if, the, if there's a rut of addiction, it's like the deepest rut of addiction is self addiction. And I love this um, assertion because it made me think of when I went home and, and mulled things over, it made me think of how, because that was kind of a new thought to me and not, not a new thought, but just a different spin on an old thought maybe. But I was mm-hmm. thinking about how when Jesus was pressed and they were saying, what's the most important thing? What is it? And he basically says, it's these two things. You need to love God primarily, supremely, and you need to love others wildly. And it comes down to, to just those two things, that that's right. it. And this deep rut of selfishness is the thing that is drawing us away from from those two things. So before we get into the book of Job, because I want to talk about that too, I'd like for maybe you to draw out a little bit, is it possible that all evil is stemming from how we serve ourselves, from selfishness? And it's an amazing thought. It's a deep thought. Yeah. Um, I very much believe that that is true. And uh, it's one of those things that I I don't know where it came from. I don't know that it's a thought that I've seen expressed elsewhere. But as yeah. I was writing The Benefactor, and I was trying to, I don't even remember the circumstance of it, but I was trying to come up with a definition of evil um, yeah. that would make it sound attractive. And mm. what he says to Kevin is, is he says, you know what, Kevin, you know what evil really is, Kevin? It's not red demons with horns and blood rites and all that nonsense. It's just selfishness, self above anyone else. And it's the purest mm-hmm. motivation and there is. God. And I got to that definition by thinking about the opposite. A lot of the shift is built around this idea of opposites. We cannot know happiness without suffering. We cannot know evil without good, or we cannot know good without evil. Um, and if you think about what is the greatest what is the opposite of, of evil? The opposite of evil is good. And what is the greatest good that has ever been done? Well, it's it's the sacrifice that Christ made for all of us on the cross, yeah. the most selfless act in history. Therefore, wow. if 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 charity, if doing things for others is the greatest love that Christ has and the greatest good that there is, then evil is just the opposite of that. Evil yeah. is just pure selfishness. And if you think about evil and you think about sin and you think about the motivation behind sin and the evil things that we do, it it, it does come down to that. It comes down to selfishness. It's acting, it's doing something that is purely because we want it and because it benefits us. There is nothing in evil that ever benefits anybody else. And so, so selfishness is the root of evil. Selfishness is evil. That's what it is. And that can be a really hard thing to realize because as soon as you have that thought, you realize, oh, crap, I'm evil all the time. Right. (laughs) I am am selfish all the time. In small deviations. Right. In in small ways. I mean, there's big ones. Sure. Sure. There's big ones. Killing somebody. There's nothing more selfish than that. You know, that's that's, you're literally taking away somebody's life for for what? and and but then it can be as simple as well you know she got more cake than i did you know my i want the i want the bigger piece you know what is that how significant is that it's not but it's but it is an expression of selfishness to say sure. that i want more than what this person has and and it's not mm. fair so it's something that's very embedded into the film and and ultimately the film has a lot to say about selfishness and ultimately the choice that kevin has to make at the end of the film is between being selfish and being selfless, which as defined by the benefactor um, means between being good and between being evil. That's the choice he yeah. makes at the end. Yeah. So let's let's move on to our main character, Kevin. Um, so by the way, Christopher Plahad is, does an amazing job. He brought oh, so much depth. Incredible in this film. So good. So, so good. Um, and I love... The, the, I mean, like right out of the gate, it starts off with such honesty, which is he didn't know if his prayer would work. 
He wasn't praying because he knew (laughs) that it would work. He was just clinging to this very last thing that he felt like he had. He was desperately needy in that moment. He was nothing but dependent. And and I think about the heart posture, that the heart posture of dependence. And what would it be like to live? with this heart posture of dependence, right? And so then I started thinking, well, that's kind of the crux of it, isn't it? Like, so we, as you were creating Kevin, did Kevin just get a little complacent? Was he not desperate anymore? Was he not clinging anymore? Was he not desperately needy? What are your thoughts around complacency versus desperation and that prayer that he offered? And I don't even know if it's going to work. Well, I think that, yeah, I think Kevin in the first act of the film is somebody who probably has become a little complacent, but maybe complacent isn't even the right word. I think Kevin is feeling a little, even even in that moment, he's feeling a little rejected by God um, Mm. coming into his confrontation with the benefactor. Because he, we see him in just 20 minutes, we see him go through this journey right. of, you know, he's, he's not a great guy. He's a hedge fund bro at, at the time of the, of the housing crisis in 2008. And there weren't a whole lot of people who were as bigger jerks than those guys in that year. Yeah. He goes yep. from that to, you know, reconnecting with his faith through meeting this woman, yep. Molly, marrying yep. her, having happiness and joy. And then losing that happiness and joy because of the tragedy that that happens to them. And so by the time we catch up, by the time Kevin meets the benefactor, he's definitely in a place, I think, and this is more subtextual, where it's just kind of like, what is it all for? Like, what is the point of, yeah. you know, like he's he's feeling some distance from his faith. He, he's certainly feeling yeah. some distance from God because he's feeling like, you know, hey, I did everything like I, like I had this happiness, then it was taken away. And I don't know why, like I I basically, you know, he's made a change in his life. He's not that guy, but things have only kind of gotten worse in in a lot of respects. And so he's coming into this confrontation with the benefactor, having this knowledge of God, but, but yes, this, this lower dedication. And so it was important to me to have the line of, yeah, I, you know, because he prays and it's this incredible thing. And it's like, oh my gosh, you, you see it. And it's like, oh my gosh, this guy's so like, this guy's so with the Lord that he's just going to pray the devil away. And, and the truth is, is that sometimes um, faith is a little more wobbly than that. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. sometimes we're just trying things and hoping it works out, you know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's who he is in that moment. It's like, I'm going to try to get back to God in this moment because I really don't know where else to turn. And I really hope it works, you know, yeah. does, you know, and it changes yeah. him. It changes him from that point forward in the film. He's a different person and he, re- he recognizes the reality of God. And that's when God completely pulls away and, mm. uh, and he's, and he's truly yeah. tested. Mm. Wow. So speaking of, of testing, um, the book of Job was your inspiration. And, and I love the tension that you kept in the line of connection because it wasn't so tight to the book of Job that maybe um, an outsider or, or non-believer would feel kind of boxed out you know, mm-hmm. by the, right. the biblical references or the language or whatever. But it wasn't so loose that the believers in the room didn't share some kind of common story, yeah. you know? Yeah. You, you could pick it up. Sure. And so I feel like yeah. that was just right. Like there's that, that tie. And, um, so Job, who we know, who has lost about everything, he's, he's weathering the storm. Okay. At first, mm-hmm. but then he gets to this place where enough has kind of been enough for him. And he is demanding an audience with God. And mm-hmm. in this is in the book of Job, not in the movie, but um, and he when he's demanding an audience with God, he becomes prosecutor and God becomes defendant. And God has this moment where he quickly says, Friend, tell me what you know about the foundation of the earth. And right. so he quickly dismisses Job's case, right? You know nothing. And and so there's there's a, a forced humility there. Um, or maybe it's an invited humility. <laughs> maybe it's just a revealed, <laughs> a revealed weakness. Um right. but the point for my, my question is that there is so much that God is up to that we are not privy to. There is so much that that God is doing that we cannot see from our place in this world. Suffering is coming. We know that. And if if your life hasn't already gotten hard, it most certainly will. 
And I feel like Kevin walked through his trial with a humble trust. There was a humble trust and it was taking a long time. Um, yeah. It, is this right that it was five years? I feel like at one point his buddy, Sean Aston Gabriel says it's been five years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He said, yeah, five, five years. How much, how much more patience you got? Yeah. Right, right, right. So what were you hoping that audiences would gain from Kevin? Maybe good or bad. What advice do you think Kevin would have for us in the midst of our trials? Because Brock, as you know, there are so many people in pain right now. Yeah. So uh, one one thing I will note, though, is that, that Kevin does have a moment in the film where he does rail against God. He does have a moment where where things he realizes. I'm doing everything he, he, I know to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. What more do you yeah. want from me? I'm doing everything I know how to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's screaming that when he says it, you know. Um, so he does get to a point where it's kind of like, man, like I am doing my best here, and 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 it's at a point where where he really, it really thinks that that, that things are going to work out. And then it's demonstrated yeah. to him that oh, nope, this is not it. This is not where things work out for you. In fact, things are going to get or things are getting worse for you. It's his job moment of of, yeah. of yelling at God, railing at God, and just and just wondering, you know, what? Where are you? So I think, look, I, I think despite that moment, what we see from Kevin is an ex- is is an extreme amount of patience. Um, and I and I have come to believe, and I've said this elsewhere, that the words faith and patience are almost synonymous. When we're talking about faith, we're really just talking about waiting. Mm. We're talking mm. about waiting for the Lord to reveal himself. Yeah. And mm. Kevin, you know, going through five years of waiting and, and even though he has his frustrations and even though he's wondering where God was, he never actually gives up on God. He never actually yeah, says right. anything against God, which is, right. which is like Job as well. Job has his struggles, but he never turns it around on God and says, "This is this is all you. You're doing this." He he never he never does that, and and Kevin doesn't either. Um, so, if Kevin were to say anything to to people, I I think he would say, um, you know, the the challenge of faith is the wait. It really, really is. As 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 the wise Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part, uh, yeah. and uh, and that can be a bitter pill to swallow. It really can be yeah. because um, I know some people wait for a very long time and sure. some people wait and don't have any hope of actual um, relief from their struggle. Yeah. Some yeah. people are dealing with things that are lifelong. Um, but I think the, I, I think, I think the other thing, and this isn't necessarily something that's in the movie. I think this is something I can draw from my own experience uh, and I think we can all draw from our own experiences. God's uh, relief doesn't always come in the form of restoration. Yeah. Actually, this is in the movie. It doesn't always come in the form of restoration. It doesn't always come in the yeah. form of healing. God's yeah. relief sometimes comes in the form of a burden shared or a new perspective. Um, God can make us happy within our struggles. Happiness does not come from relief from the struggle. Oh, yeah. Not always. Sometimes yeah. it does. Yeah. Sometimes it does. And that's great. That's great when that can happen. But God's promise is, is that he will share our burdens. And that means that no matter what you are enduring, there is not only happiness to be found on the other side of it, should you get there in this life, certainly in the next life there is, but there is also happiness to be found within it. And, and you can actually feel better within your struggle than you ever did before you had it. I truly, truly yeah. believe that. And I have examples from my own life that I can, I can cite for that. Sure. Oh, thank you so much for that. That is, that will preach to a lot of people, um, that are carrying a lot. I, you know, the movie obviously has this huge central message of hope and there's something about our, in, with our shared faith and, and what hope means to a Christian is, is definitely, um, different than just optimism. Um, right. there's more to that word in, in our Christian space. And I think that you mapped that out really well with that answer. It's really, really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, any parting thoughts, anything you want us to know or anything you want to leave us with before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, go see the movie. If you haven't seen the movie and, and if you haven't seen the movie, yes. then we've spoiled a little bit of it, but I don't think too bad. I, I think we've done no, a good job I don't, of, yeah. of keeping a lot of things secret. Um, and if, if you're interested in seeing it, it's a, um, you can find 
where it is playing near you at angel.com slash the shift. And for those that don't have means, there's also free tickets available at angel.com slash share the shift. Uh, we know that not everybody is able to afford to go to the movies. And so we provided a way, Angel Studios has provided a way for people to enjoy the film anyway, uh, while it is yes. where it should be, which is on the big screen. And, and if you're somebody who wants to help out other people, you can also pay it forward at angel.com slash share the shift. But I don't want to just end with an advertisement for the movie. Um, so I, I, I will say that going into this movie, if you are concerned about it in any way, if you're wondering, oh, I don't, I don't know, sci-fi. Um, I love, Allison, that your experience was, I don't really like sci-fi, but I love this movie. And, yeah. and I, that is something I hear a lot. And it's something that um, that is really unexpected. Um, but I think that, look, the stories that I love have an emotional core and, and reality to them. Yeah. And there is yeah. a strong... Like people are having a very strong reaction to this film. Um, they're having a very emotional experience with this film. It's speaking to people on so many different levels um, and in so many different ways and ways I haven't even anticipated. I, I've, I've enjoyed so much reading people's comments because yeah. they're taking things out of the film that I didn't even know were there and they're right. making it very personal to them. And I think that's what our best stories do. And so I, I, I see that as a huge compliment. Um yeah. I would say in your preparation to go see the film, um, I would challenge you to look at it through spiritual eyes, look at it through the eyes of, of allegory. Um, this is a film that is operating on a level that is maybe a little bit different from the typical faith film and maybe a little bit different from the typical sci-fi film. In blending the two things together, I'm asking the audience to approach the story in a different way and to look at it through different eyes. And those that are willing to do that and go on the journey um, I think are are being rewarded for that. That's certainly the reports I'm getting. I've been um, really blown away by the responses to this film. Um, you know, hopefully, I can say this without it sounding um, like I'm like like I'm trying to talk myself up. I really don't even see the no. film as mine anymore. But 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 people are having, um, in some cases, they're having life changing experiences with this film. Like it, it really is. Look, it's, it's entertaining. That's my first job is to entertain. And I, and, and I know that because I'm making a movie. I'm not, I'm not writing a sermon here um, or, or, or giving a sermon here, but, but people are having a profound experience within the entertainment um, that is, that is really shaking them up in, in a good way. Um, and that's hugely, hugely satisfying to me because it, that's more than anything tells me, okay. I, I I think we hit the mark on this one. I think I think we did what we set out to do. So I would just invite people to come and see the movie and and give yourself over to it. Let it let it do its thing. Um, because if you do, I, I think you'll be rewarded. Yes. Co-signed. Co-signed a million times over. Brock, it's such a delight. I'm so grateful to God that he has crossed our paths and that I know your family and that I can cheer for your work. I hope that he keeps crossing them again and again and again. I made a reel of mine and Silas's time in LA and the music that I put to it was pretty intentional and it's called um, A Garden in Manhattan. And some of the lyrics were, I'll be a garden in Manhattan, a river when it's dry, when my friends can't find the road, I'll be a roadside welcome sign. Sunshine in Seattle, a cool breeze in July, a light in the darkness. I'll be a garden, a garden in Manhattan. And if I could edit that, I would just say in Los Angeles, in LA, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where you are that. busy doing your important work. And I, I just, you are... Um, I guess gardens in LA aren't quite as rare as they are in Manhattan, but I'm just grateful for the light that you shine and for the faith that you bring to what is often a very secular space and that you don't do it um, obnoxiously or intrusively <laughs> or um, forcefully, um, that it is an invitation, that there is a subtle woo to everything that you do. It is just Jesus's way. And I'm so, so grateful to know you and cheer for you. Um, everybody, please go see The Shift. Thank you for coming on, Brock. I hope we see each other again soon. Hello, Beefinator. This is the very first episode of season 11. Can you believe it? Yay! Welcome <laughs> back. So glad we're here. Me too. I love. I was telling Brock. I was like, "Guess what? You are the very first third um, third time like repeater coming uh -huh. third time guest." So Yay. he thought that was great. Yeah, um, such 
a good interview as always. Um, it's not very often that I invite people back again and again and again, but he always has so much to say. And then mm-hmm. all of our similar interests make it really fun. So that was a, a fun talk and obviously a great time in LA. So <laughs> yeah, I want to hear more about it. I mean, I want to hear more about your perspective. So I obviously was following everything that I could follow while you were there. Um, yeah. And it was so fun to see you experience it and to see Silas experience it and see y'all doing it. To, like the core memories that y'all created, yeah, it was yeah. so beautiful. So yeah. what were your favorite parts as you were I, Well, I love that too. I was talking about how I was a little, I was apprehensive because just these unknown new situations. I've never done this before. I actually don't enjoy um, a big party or small talk. Like it's just my strengths lie elsewhere. And so I was anxious and my kid was not. And it was so great because Mm -hmm. I didn't have a person. You know, like I, we, it was the two of us and mm-hmm. he was my person, which has never happened before. I'm always, you know, a safety yeah. net for him, um, a comforter for him. And he was for me. So it was this huge, you know, uh, role shift that felt great. It was so fun. It was really, really great. I love it. Um, and you get to have like mom strength, right? Like our kids always bring that out in yes. us. So like being yes, there yes, for yes. him and love yeah. it. Um, Okay. I feel like you have always been such a cheerleader for Brock and like seeing Mm -hmm. him early Mm -hmm. on and following him. Um, you're such a good cheerleader for him. I I do love a good set of pom-poms. Yes. I, (laughs) I, I I feel like he's easy to root for because he, first of all, has such noble character and is trying to bring that into what can be a dark space. Um, so I appreciate that endeavor, but I also appreciate his methods. So um, encouragement, I feel like it allows us when we might be creating things can have a, um, a sheepish quality about yeah. it once you're trying to release it. And so I feel like that's when encouragement comes in and can kind of be like a, an arm lifter. You know, if, if, if Aaron is holding up Moses's arms, it's like when it's go time, when it's go time, you might need a little help. And Mm -hmm. being that help is such a fun place for me to be like as a person, my personality. Well, you are so gifted at being a cheerleader and seeing people's gifts and recognizing them and celebrating them. Um, And it creates community, I feel like between you and that one person, but then you're able to share it with all of us, right? And and bring us into that um, and help us to know him um, and encourage him and appreciate his work because it is incredible. Yeah, so nice. Um, So you have to go see the movie soon. I know you haven't seen it yet, so I'm not going to say much about it, except that I do want to know, movies are sometimes hard for you, Beef, because you're on the go. So I understand. Mm -hmm. I know. I get it. But when you do commit, what is it for you that makes a good movie? Okay. You're you're not wrong. I wish that I was more of a movie person, but I am not. Um, But I do try because I live with movie people. Um. So for me, I think I, sorry, not sorry, but I want to feel like I learned something or like thought Uh about something new, but I don't want to feel like I'm learning. Right. Like I want to feel like I spent my time well, but I don't want to feel like I went to school. Right. Um, So that's, we're going to go see it in December. um, And I can't wait. I think you're going to love exactly what you just said. I think you're going to have some things to think about um, when you go home. But that's what I makes a good movie to me is it something that you can keep thinking of that you kind of toss around for the next couple of days. That's, that's always a good marker for me. Yep. Yep. All right. Love you, Beef. Today's show was a production of Allison Sullivan in conjunction with the Forte Catholic Podcast Network. For more great Catholic podcasts, head on over to ForteCatholic.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.